Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and um, I wish, first of all, to, to thank the, this very generous uh, invitation to join and to participate in this uh, webinar. And I also welcome the very qualified uh, audience that uh, is uh, attending this uh, webinar. Um, I would say that um, the, the spirit and the purpose of the Portuguese presidency um, is contained in its motto. Its motto says, time to deliver a fair, green, digital recovery. Uh, we think uh, we were, uh, we, we were uh, uh, a bit inspired by the speech of the President of the Commission uh, to the European Parliament uh, last September, when uh, she told us, well, we made strategic decisions in this year, 2020, uh, mainly the revolutionary decision to uh, launch a recovery fund in order that all the member states had the appropriate amount of financial resources to finance the, recover, the recovery of their uh, economies and so the preservation of the internal market. And now, next year, it will be time to deliver, to concretize, to materialize the decisions that were uh, taken. Uh, when uh, we say in uh, Portuguese that it's time to action, we, we say that uh, it's time to concretize the decisions that we uh, collectively have taken. So it's time to deliver. It's the, the, the first crucial verb of the Portuguese presidents is the verb to implement. We need to implement as far as soon as we, as we can the new multi-annual financial framework. This means the new programs that will finance uh, research and innovation in Europe, the European connectivity, the academic mobility uh, with the Erasmus uh, program, the new program for health and so on. So we need to implement, first of all, the new multi-annual um, uh, financial framework. We need to implement <clears throat> the recovery fund. We need to implement what we call the instruments for recovery and resilience. And we need to concretize this approval through the approval of each national plan for investment and reforms that each member state will first negotiate with the European Commission and then uh, submit to approval to the Council. We need to implement the far-reaching, the, the most important response to the pandemic that we can have. I'm speaking of the vaccination. You know, and we have to keep in mind this very important fundamental decision of the European uh, Union that was to conceive the vaccine as a basic good, a public good, a universal good. Uh, the universal accessibility of the vaccine, the full vaccination of our population, and the strong cooperation with third countries in order to guarantee that uh, uh, population around the world can access to this basic good was the very fundamental decision option of the European Union. And uh, as you perhaps uh, remember, unfortunately, it was not accompanied by countries like the United States or Russia. But for us, it's a basic commitment. So to implement the vaccination strategy, to implement the vaccination uh, process. And of course, we need uh, the other verb, is the verb to reform. Uh, we, we, we need to implement, of course, to, to, to deliver, to, to obtain certain outcomes and results, but uh, in a certain way, 
in a certain direction, with a certain strategy, uh, following the strategic agenda the leaders, the European leaders, have uh, approved in uh, 2019, the so-called uh, strategic agenda 2019-2024. And what tells us this agenda? Is that the, the, the recovery of the economy has to be at the same time the transformation of our economy. Um, greening it, if I may use the word, and digitalizing it. So the double transition, the digital transition and the green transition are at the core of the recovery of our economy, the transformation of our economy. This is a, a fundamental assumption of the new recovery fund. We are getting this amount of money, uh, 1.8 trillion uh, euros uh, for member states for the next year, not to invest for investing, not for spend, to spend for spending, but with a certain purpose, to transform our economy, to transform our public uh, administration in order to modernize it, uh, in order to uh, fulfill uh, all the goals and the obligations that uh, we currently assume under the Paris Agreement, uh, the climate action, the protection of biodiversity, and also the implementation of the artificial intelligence and the profiting from the data science with respect for the rights of citizens. So this is the, the other fundamental verb of our presidency, to reform. And to, 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 pa to pass successfully, to, to have a success in this double transition, the digital transition and the green transition, we must emphasize the social model of Europe. And I always say this is really the added value of the Portuguese presidency is to emphasize the underline, to underline the need to reinforce the social dimension of Europe. Of course, this has a, a, a certain dimension of uh, implementation. Uh, in 2017, in uh, Gothenburg, we decided to, uh, we, we issued a political declaration, so a political commitment uh, that was called the European pillar for social rights. And now it's time to implement this pillar. Uh, a communication of the uh, Commission is expected next February with a plan, an action plan to implement the European pillar of social rights. And we will organize an event, uh, what we call the Social Summit in Porto next May with a high level conference uh, joining the European institutions and the social partners, and then the informal European Council, uh, giving political orientation and impulse to the implementation of uh, uh, social rights. But this has also a, a programmatic uh, um, uh, dimension, because um, uh, we have to keep always in mind that um, the European economy is a market economy, but a social market economy. The, the European democracy is a liberal democracy. There is no such thing as an illiberal democracy. <laughs> uh, illiberal democracy simply does not exist. So we are liberal democracies, but we are liberal democracies with a very important social dimension. And European social model is not an obstacle for growth and employment. On the contrary, it is a drive, a driver for growth and employment in Europe. So uh, this uh, dealing with, uh, let, let us call it for uh, um, simplicity, um, the internal dimension of European construction. Now moving to the external dimension. Um, I, I would, uh, I could summarize the purpose of the Portuguese presidency 
in this way. We need to reinforce the autonomy of Europe, but in an open way. Uh, in, uh, and how can we do that? Uh, opening Europe uh, um, to all the main regions of the world. So we, we had in 2020 uh, a summit, a virtual summit, but a summit with China. We are preparing since uh, the beginning of this year, uh, the new uh, European Union, African Union summit. We are trying to relaunch our dialogue with Latin America. The election of Joe Biden undoubtedly will represent a new momentum and a new opportunity for uh, returning to normal in relations between uh, Europe and America. And of course, we will seize this opportunity. We don't know yet how shall we conclude the current negotiations with the United Kingdom, but for sure, the United Kingdom will continue to be a European country and a close ally to uh, all the member states of uh, the European Union. So we thought that, again, we could add some value, bringing also India and relationship with India to the core of our external policy. That's why we are going to organize uh, an event of all the European leaders, heads of state and government, and the Prime Minister Modi. And why that? Because it is necessary to unblock the current impasse that we can see in the, the economic negotiations with India. India is a very important market, uh, market, is a very important partner, and we have to unblock the current difficulties of our um, economic negotiation. But besides that, and more important than that, is the political dialogue. We have to, to think this way because it's, the, it's true and it's necessary to think like this. India and European Union are the largest democracies in the world. India means 1.4 billion people, almost, and Europe means 450 million people living in democratic regimes. And these two democratic blocs have to improve their political relations. So, um, just to summarize, you can uh, uh, understand the priorities of the Portuguese uh, presidency. If you remember our motto, time to deliver a fair green digital recovery, you can understand, I think, um, uh, very well the spirit of the Portuguese presidency and the, what is the purpose of the Portuguese presidency if you combine these two verbs, to implement and to reform, and you can understand the, the geopolitical ambition of the Portuguese presidency, if you think uh, on this idea of having a 360 degrees approach with geopolitical balance, we need to improve the relations with the United States, we need to keep uh, the current conversations with China, but we, we need to, to keep in mind the, 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 the full mosaic and to understand the full mosaic of international relations. You have to consider Africa, you have to consider Latin America, you have to consider India and the Indo-Pacific. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. That's a, a very comprehensive overview of the objectives of the uh, Portuguese presidency. Um, now we can go to some question and answers. Um, but before doing so, uh, could I ask you uh, one of my own? What do you see as the biggest challenge uh, in implementing the recovery program as you undertake the six months? And, uh, may I give a very short and concrete response. 
the, if, you wish, if you wish. Yeah. Um, I will uh, obtain a, a certain uh, state of uh, spiritual relief the day in which all the ratifications needed by all the member states are concluded. That's the, the next difficulty. Because I think that compared to, to that difficulty, the process of negotiation with the European Commission and then the approval by the council will be relatively easy. And why do I say this? Because we all agree in the parameters, in the, in the metrics that uh, will uh, provide the, 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 the assessment of our national plans. We know that we have to spend at least 37% uh, of the money in uh, measures uh, related to climate change. We know that we have to spend at least 20% of the money in measures related to digital transition. And we know that our plans will be assessed by the Commission, considering the country specific recommendations that were issued in 2018 and 2019. Yes. That's that's something good to aim for. I have a number of questions, Minister. We have indeed um, a question from Shada Islam, who's the managing director of the New Horizons project and EU commentator for The Guardian newspaper. And he asks, uh, given Portugal's longstanding interest in Africa, how will Portugal give the EU Africa relationship new energy and meaning? Well, I, I do think uh, I'm going to be a little provocative that uh, this new energy is needed. Uh, the meaning is clarified, I think, since the Abidjan summit in 2017. We, we, we took two important decisions in Abidjan. The first one was to consider that uh, the relationship, what we call the partnership between Europe and Africa, was first of all a first priority for both countries uh, because they are neighbors, because they are complementarity, com uh, sorry, complementary. Uh, and um, the, the partnership had to, to have a large spectrum, not only at to development is very important, but is not sufficient. Not only migration is very important, but not uh, the, the whole picture of the thing, but uh, empowerment of women, uh, institutional uh, building, um, <clears throat> uh, education and uh, training, uh, economic um, uh, trade relations and investment. And the second decision that we took was to consider that uh, this partnership had to be a partnership between equals. It's not a question of one of us helping the other or lecturing the other or supporting the other, is trying to, 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 to take full profit of this complementarity I was referring to and the need to improve an inter, uh, an inter relation based on uh, equal uh, rights, including the right to define the agenda. Okay, so I think there is no need to, to change this, but there is a need to comply with this, to abide by this. Um, uh, now, this is a small provocation that I'm going to do. Uh, in uh, 2018, uh, the former president of the commission, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, great, uh, truly great um, European leader and a very good uh, friend of mine, delivered a very important speech to the, to the European Parliament, presenting the new alliance between Europe and Africa for growth and employment. A very, very important agenda a very, very important document. And whenever I spoke in the, the subsequent, in the following months to European, to African colleagues, they always uh, said to me, it was a very important document, 
a very important speech, a very important content. We have no disagreement. But why didn't you speak with us before? Why did you present your strategy to your parliament? Why don't we work together in a joint agenda? And I think this is the, 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 the main contribution Portugal uh, can do. Because in 2007, during the Portuguese presidency, we did, we did uh, elaborate a common strategy, Europe-Africa, that is the ongoing strategy that was prepared by a team composed of African experts and European experts. So I would say that uh, we need energy. Uh, there is a very good result in uh, the last days, during the last days of November, that was the conclusion of the agreement on uh, the post-Cotonou post uh, agreement, so the, the framework for cooperation with Sub-Saharan Africa. There is now the, the external service is preparing uh, uh, what will be, I think, a very important document on the improvement of the uh, South neighborhood. So our relation with North Africa and Middle East. So we can expect that uh, 2021 can be a good year in our relations, but, but it has to follow the right method. First, working on a common agenda. Then ministers having their uh, ministerial meeting. And finally, the, the leaders uh, having the summit. But we are short of time. Why? China has already scheduled the China-Africa Forum for the second semester of the next year. And uh, I would say that it would be a shame for Europe if the Euro European Union-African Union Summit would be after the China-Africa forum. If we are, we have to be coherent in our acts with what we say in our words. Thank you. Thank you. I think you, Minister, you'll find a willing partner in Ireland for the Africa strategy because uh, such a priority given by the Irish government to relations with Africa. Uh, and uh, we, we, I'm sure we will look forward to working with Portugal in that. Uh, another very topical question, Minister, for today from Caterina de Moni uh, from Reuters News Agency. And she asks, does the minister think a trade deal between Britain and the EU is still possible? If not, how will the Portuguese EU presidency deal with this issue? Um, I think it is possible, but please ask me January the 1st. Uh, but if it is not possible, of course, we have to... Um, trade according to the WTO uh, rules, but we cannot, we cannot renounce to a close relationship between uh, Britain and UK. Uh, I, I'm, uh, as you said, I'm a full professor in the faculty, in the faculty of, economics, in ec of economics, but uh, I don't think that we can think economy outside of the political and, and the institutional context. That's why I would say that um, we need a strong relationship with Britain and Britain needs a strong relationship with uh, Europe, but on four complementary dimensions. The first one is the convergence the affinity between our external policies. France, European permanent member of, in, Council, in the Security Council, is fully aligned with the United Kingdom, the other European 
permanent member of the Security Council. Uh, Europe and uh, the United Kingdom have, have the same views on uh, the JCPOA treaty, on uh, the Paris Agreement, on uh, the 2030 agenda and uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, on WTO and the reform of WTO. And this is essential to maintain this convergence. Then second dimension, cooperation. We need to cooperate and to maintain our cooperation and to improve our cooperation with the United Kingdom in defense and security, be it in NATO, be it through the complementarity between NATO and the EU. We need to cooperate with the United Kingdom in uh, matters of uh, interior affairs and justice affairs. And we need to cooperate and to cooperate more with the United Kingdom in the common combat to terrorism and to against radicalization. And this, these are really critical points. Then we need the, the third dimension, the, the economic dimension. Uh, of course, uh, there, there are some difficulties, but uh, let's have hope. And we need to maintain a close people-to-people -people context. It's a, unimaginable. I cannot imagine, at least as a Portuguese, that uh, after 20 or 30 years of uh, uh, easy flows of people between uh, Europe and Britain, British living in Europe, Europeans living and working in Britain, uh, we can discuss of passports, visas, difficulties, restrictive migration policies, and so on. We, we need to maintain through tourism, through mobility, through uh, work conditions, and so on. We need to maintain a strong people-to-people -people, um, uh, relation between UK and uh, EU. And may I be, uh, again, somehow provocative? My question as a foreign minister is this, compared with the need to converge in external policy, to cooperate in defense and security, to maintain a people to people relationship, what is the value of a divergence on fisheries quotas? We have to put things into context and we have to put things in their real dimension. And uh, as a teacher, as a professor at my university, I always taught my students that you have to compare, to contextualize, and to understand in each moment what is the major variable and what is the minor variable. And the major variable in our relationship is external policy, is cooperation, is defense, is mobility, and of course, it is also trade. Thank you for that, Minister. We continue to hope that the sensible path you outlined uh, will, will indeed prevail. Uh, if I could move on to a question from uh, a colleague of mine, Ross Fitzpatrick, in the research about Merck, an IA researcher about Mercosur. And uh, he says that the Portuguese presidency has committed to ensuring the EU Mercosur agreement moves forward in 2021. And what are the minister's views on the potential environmental impact of an agreement, given concerns uh, that such a deal could lead to a further destruction of the Amazon rainforest? Obviously, the Mercosur agreement is of considerable importance to everybody in the union, but your views on that, Minister, uh, about the environmental impact? Uh, of course, the, the environmental uh, issue is very important. And I would uh, argue that this was one of the leading criteria in our negotiations. Um, there are uh, uh, several uh, commitments by the parties in what regards the respect for the um, Paris Agreement, 
and uh, the climate action and the commitment against deforestation processes or other process that could uh, put in danger biodiversity. <clears throat> so I don't think that uh, a no deal on, with Mercosur would be more beneficial for uh, Amazon, uh, Amazonia, the, 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 the tropical forest in uh, Brazil, uh, than uh, the Mercosur uh, agreement. That said, I uh, have to uh, admit that uh, there are uh, doubts, legitimate doubts and uh, um, uh, objections that are uh, put in place by uh, MEP, MEPs, uh, members of the European Parliament, uh, uh, NGOs, um, civil society, and some governments of the European Union. So we have to do what we always do in such circumstances. Speak again uh, to each other and try to find a way of clarifying doubts and of uh, um, reinforcing, strengthening commitments. So I think that uh, the current um, essays, the, the current, uh, the, sorry, the current work that he's been doing at uh, the level of the European Commission and at the level of the Council in order to have uh, a declaration, uh, an annex, uh, uh, something that can clarify the um, environmental obligations of the parties is a good work and uh, it can produce results. That said, I also think that uh, we have here at stake uh, credibility issue, and we have uh, here at stake uh, a fundamental issue for foreign policy and trade policy of the European Union. May let me explain very briefly. Uh, uh, credibility, our credibility is at stake because we're negotiating during almost 20 years. We reached an agreement. The entity which reached an agreement on how our, our behalf was competent, the European Commission, and we have to respect our own commitments. If we say to Mercosur, uh, we are no longer committed to what we decided to agree upon a year ago, uh, when the, the, the next time we will negotiate with other partner, this partner can say, I don't believe you. I don't believe you because with Mercosur, you're negotiating um, through two, dec two decades. Uh, we, you finalized an agreement and you didn't respect your own agreement. So first of all, an issue of credibility. But more, even more important than that, an issue that, is, uh, that has to do with a, with a fundamental option, or choice the European Union has to, to have. Do we want to think that we are a kind of special one, a very special, demanding, sophisticated entity, we, the European Union, that for that reason cannot have agreements with other partners because those partners are not uh, fulfilling all the human rights we demand because uh, these partners don't uh, obey to our own uh, labor standards because they are not uh, so respectful of the social rights as we are, because uh, they are not uh, so careful of uh, food security as we are, because they are not democracies the way we are. Are we willing to uh, make all our trade policy dependent upon this kind of uh, criteria or not? We, do we want to be in a position of a certain isolationism in the world or we don't. 
Last November, 15 countries of the uh, Eastern Asia um, signed an economic agreement. I'm going, I'm going to say the names of these countries. Uh, Thailand, uh, Myanmar, uh, Singapore, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, Philippines, and two other countries of the, um, ASEAN, uh, Australia, New Zealand, are very close allies to, to Europe, Korea, Japan, very close allies to Europe and China. What are the, what are the countries that are missing here? India? United States, European Union. We, we, we cannot leave, uh, we cannot abandon one of the most important instruments of our influence in the world, the FTAs, the free trade agreement. We cannot abandon this, this uh, instrument. But if we don't conclude the process with Mercosur, the risk of abandoning is quite real. So the Portuguese presidents, of course, we, we don't expect to conclude this process. It's a very difficult one, but we want to move forward. We want again to um, favor some kind of uh, commitment. We are speaking with our European friends. We are speaking with Latin America friends in order to, to find what the diplomats call a landing zone. <laughs> Yes, and uh, we hope that that, that that will come to pass. Uh, another question which brings us back to Europe, uh, and specifically, of course, uh, our EU, um, from Mark Dempsey, who's the EU Policy Advisor and Executive Studies at Hertie School in Berlin. And he asks, how does Portugal plan to tackle continuing challenges to judicial independence and civil liberties in Poland and Hungary, given the recently agreed rule of law mechanism, uh, which may take at least 18 months to implement? Um, uh, the way we decided, the way the European leaders uh, decided. Um, what have we decided? Well. Back to 20, uh, 20, uh, 2007, we decided to include an Article 7. Well, we decided to include an Article 2 in uh, our treaty, uh, setting explicitly what are our common values that are, of course, sine non conditions to belonging to the European Union. And we decided to include an Article 7 explaining the procedures and consequences uh, that uh, we could, uh, we should uh, take if uh, any of us would put in peril, in danger, the, the values um, presented in Article 2. So there is currently two processes under Article 7 in the Council. Uh, one against uh, Hungary uh, launched by the European Parliament, the other against uh, Poland, uh, and we will pursue these two processes. Then we, uh, with a very important uh, contribution of the Croatian uh, presidency, and, down, and then because of the important uh, action taken by the German presidency, we have now a new mechanism, a peer review assessment of our uh, state of art concerning the human rights, the, the rule of law and the independence of the judiciary in all member states. The first report was issued by the European Commission last uh, September or October, and then we did already uh, we already did uh, in-depth assessment of five member states that were chosen by alphabetical order. That was the only criteria. Portugal, the Portuguese presidents, presidency, we will go on with this process, organizing the in-depth assessment of the next, of the following uh, group of five member states, uh, countries like Germany, like France, like Spain, 
like Greece, like Denmark, uh, I think, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm speaking by heart, uh, are now in this second group. And we believe in this peer review uh, mechanism. <laughs> I am professionally a scientist. Many uh, people attending to, to the webinar uh, work in uh, uh, think tanks, research centers, universities, and, and you know how important is this peer review, how, how pressing, how the, the enormous capacity of the standard setting throughout these uh, processes. And third, complementary um, uh, mechanism is this conditionality mechanism that we, the, uh, the leaders decided last July. So um, the allocation of uh, European funds will be in the next uh, multi-annual uh, framework will be also dependent upon our compliance with the rule of law. And this is a, a good step for, forward. As you know, Poland and uh, Hungary contested it. Um, the Portuguese way was, uh, in this case, the European way. We listened to their arguments and we said, well, there is a valid argument in, in this point. Um, the need for legal uh, certainty. But the, the, in our uh, institutional architecture, the, the body that can decide if the thing is legal or illegal is the court. So let's, uh, and the compromise was, we will not apply, the, the commission will not apply the new mechanism before the European Court of Justice can pronounce uh, its legality. We think it's legal, so we, we are comfortable with this uh, procedure. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, I just I have another question. Um, Portugal will, will advance a deeper integration uh, in the EU. Uh, how, how will you go ahead with this? Will this be a deeper economic integration, political integration? I know you feel that this is necessary because uh, of events where the we have been pulling away from the U US in the last few years and the difficulties with China with Russia. So we have, uh, I think, developed a more uh, greater sense of the need to stand alone. How will you bring this forward? Well, um, may I use a football metaphor? It's, a, uh, it's, it's permissible, yes. It's, okay, because for, for many times our national team played very well in a, in a rather Brazilian way with a certain beauty but was not effective. Now we are more effective, we are more pragmatism. So uh, it's perhaps surprising for uh, the audience, this uh, pragmatism that uh, is the, the thread of my intervention in this uh, webinar. But I, I, I think that in order to deliver, in order to act, we have to be pragmatic. So the Portuguese position is, uh, is this one. Let's not, uh, open new dossiers before completing the dossiers that we have. We took decisions. We took decisions in Maastricht. We took decisions in Nice. We took decisions in uh, Lisbon that are not yet implemented. Uh, one uh, and uh, uh, one and uh, perhaps the most uh, urgent one, most important one, was the decision to create. Uh, economic and monetary union. The economic and monetary union, euro area, is not completed. The banking union is not completed because there is not yet a European insured mechanism for banking deposits. So the resolution is now, the banking resolution is under the responsibility of a uh, European body, the, Internet, the European Central Bank, but the financial responsibilities associated with the resolution are still under 
the national budgets and the, the national taxpayers. So we have to conclude this. We decided to advance in, uh, um, in, uh, in a common monetary policy. But the, you know, the automatic stabilizers are still in the hands of a national member state. We don't have a reinsured mechanism at the European level for uh, unemployment subsidies. So the, 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 the rules for budget, budget policy are already European, but the costs for budgetary pol policy are still uh, national. Um, and I couldn't move uh, forward. Uh, the, the, the union of uh, the financial markets is not yet concluded. And we are discussing for years and years if we need a European monetary funds, a European treasury, if we need a common budget uh, with a real expression. And it was exceptionally because of the pandemic that we decided the first uh, common uh, debt issuance uh, with some uh, expression. So, uh, euro area, the conditions, the, 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 the dimensions of the uh, European uh, economic, um, the, the, of the economic and monetary, uh, monetary union are still at stake. Let's, let's move on on this. So I would, I, would, I would say that this is not the time for another federalist movement or for a pushback. I would not recommend to open again a, a very, always very complex and uncertain discussion on treaties, on the institutional architecture. I would recommend to to, to organize the, 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 the European, poli, uh, the European public, poli, public uh, policies and to complete the, the dossiers that we opened 20 years ago, 10 years ago, or five years ago. And for me, this is really the sense, this is the really the raison d'etre of the Conference on the Future of Europe. The Conference on the Future of Europe has to be a sort of um, common house, a uh, sort of uh, living room, but a Portuguese living room in which for, uh, the people speak, uh, speak and uh, say things to not, not a living room in which we are silent seeing television. No, a living room when we speak in a very Italian or Portuguese uh, way, loudly if necessary. But the conference has to be a living room in which European institutions, member states, the social partners, the NGOs and citizens chosen in a random way can discuss the future of Europe, not matters of the faculty of law, not details of uh, the Brussels machinery, but uh, the needs of the citizens, the voice of the citizens, and the public policies that can uh, respond to them. There is, um, if I may, uh, quote uh, an extraordinary American economist, uh, uh, British American economist, Albert Hirschman, you know, that uh, he said that all the, the forms of um, action could be uh, summarized in this uh, triple dimension, to exit, uh, to be loyal, or to voice. And uh, he explained very well that um, in authoritarian regimes, in traditional regimes, we are asked to be loyal, uh, period. In uh, um, authoritarian regimes or, or in, uh, in pure markets, you can exit, in markets you can exit, but in democracies, 
you have the right to the voice. So let's apply this right to complete the avenues we opened and not to open other avenues without completing the former ones. Yes. That's a poetic way. That's, <laughs> say. that's a very wise and, as you say, poetic way. We are running out of time, Mr. and I promised faithfully to let you go at two o'clock. Uh, I just want to mention that our, our uh, Ralph Victory, our ambassador in Portugal, reminds us that uh, Ireland is taking over uh, its term on the Security Council on the 1st of January, and that uh, we, he, we do hope that uh, we can, of course, cooperate closely with the Portuguese presidency and that there will be greater EU-UN cooperation uh, over the coming months, which I think is, is a hope we all would. Uh, we could hold you on, Minister, for another hour because we have many more questions and I'm sorry we have not uh, come to them, but uh, we want to wish you uh, every possible success in the uh, forthcoming six months. Uh, you have a huge agenda, uh, but we place every confidence in the presidency uh, that you will uh, implement your your action agenda and and uh, uh, for uh, all that has to be done following on decisions and now it's action time so our very best wishes and our thanks to you and in the meantime um, we wish you a happy Christmas and a happy Christmas also to all our participants thank you for the very rich discussion minister a lot of to think about and, uh, thank you very much if I can say some final words. Let me um, um, invoke my admiration for the British history, the British people, and also for the British literature, and say that uh, perhaps we can uh, take uh, on the back of our mind during the first semester two great novels by Charles Dickens. In hard times, great expectations. Merry Christmas. <laughs>